The Allianz Life Pro Plus Advantage is one of the most popular Index Universal Life products in the industry right now. There's a lot of variables to why that's the case, but in this video, I'm gonna break down the Allianz Pro Plus Advantage illustration, talk about where it really falls short, why I believe it's the most sold product, and ultimately, why I think you should avoid it like the plague. Now, warning, this is a 55-page illustration that we're gonna be going into here, and that is a lot. It's a lot of time. I'm gonna do my best to be as detailed as possible, um, but just know as you go through it, if you have any questions, make sure you comment in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to engage and answer every single question that you have. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell. That way you're notified every time I launch a new video. Let's get into it. Hey, what's going on, Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris with Life180. In this video, we're gonna be going over the Allianz uh, Life Pro Plus Advantage IUL. Now, you probably can't see it very well. It's kind of blown out on the monitor uh, with the camera with the way that we have the lighting set up, but I'm gonna share my monitor in a second. I'm gonna share that screen. What I'm gonna do in this video is do a full overview of the Allianz uh, product here because I think this is becoming one of the more popular sold products on uh, on the market when it comes to index universal life policies. I'm gonna cover why that's the case. I'm gonna cover uh, where uh, this, these, some risks are inside of this product and ultimately talk about kind of the nuances of how this product works and why I think this product will never perform as it's ultimately sold. So let's get into it. I'm just gonna go right to the board here, pop myself up in the corner and uh, we can go here we go so let's uh you can see here i I've, I've tried to redact all the information right so you can see this is a policy that was pretty new uh prepared on uh january 23rd at the time i am filming this video now there are 55 slides 55 slides 55 pages on this illustration which should go to show how crazy uh, this this is like to need 55 pages for a life insurance illustration you're gonna see all the disclaimers and all the legal jargon and all the different things that they put in this uh, that really is designed to position protection of the company not you the insured now uh, so what I'm gonna do just with that noted obviously if I were to speak in super detail about every single page this would be a three-hour video okay so it's important to understand that I'm gonna do my best to focus on the relevant information uh, I would encourage, I'm gonna zoom in, I would encourage you to pause. If you have any questions about anything on any page, leave it in the comment section below, leave a timestamp on that comment, and I will do my best to go back and engage and answer everything that I possibly can. Now, what you can see here, uh, this is the premium. They got a $16,421 uh, premium for years one through 10, total amount of $164,000. You can see here, this is kind of a summary, right? It's got the death benefit a summary. This is all based on current assumptions, right? Um, and it shows that you put in, uh, where does it show this here? I just saw it a second ago. That you put in the $164,000, but look at down here, the policy loans, what you have the ability to do, says annual policy loans of 77,000 um, with total policy loans of $5,437,000. So what does that mean? This is saying you can put in $164,000 and pull out and over 10 years and pull out $5,437,000, right? Um, and I got news for you. If you believe that it can do that, um, you know, I got a bridge to sell you somewhere. Um, so what this is showing also is that the loan charge currently uh, is 5% plus 50%. This is what they're illustrating. They're saying the credit rated uh, that's credited is plus this 50 basis point. So I talk about this a lot. Um, this illustration is showing the ability to illustrate positive 50 basis points of arbitrage, okay? That is the regulations. That's what regulation AG49A allows to do. This year in 2023, these illustrations are no longer going to be allowed to show that 50 basis points of positive, uh, positive arbitrage. So it's important to understand that. Now, um, if index loans are present in this illustration, I'm going down to the bottom here. If index loans are present in this illustration, the loan portion will receive an index interest credit uh, of, to the lesser of the illustrated rate or the loan charge, currently 5% plus a 50 basis point. So once again, that's saying the same thing, right? Um, and so this is just kind of like the setup of the policy, um, kind of inconsequential. Once again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on uh, the important things here. <clears throat> 
Here you can see this is just a schedule of the premium, $164,000 over 10 years. Um, these are based on the current scenario, right? Uh, the cash value, accumulated value, um, the, the cash value that you have, this is the surrender value. This is the amount that you'd be able to borrow against. This is the uh, accumulated value that you're actually earning indexed uh, crediting on uh, with the basic assumptions that we have once again inside of the policy. I feel like it's always important to say that. Um, but as we go down through here, um, you know, it, it is, it, it's just, once again, I just want you to see here, you got the $164,000 uh, and the money is gonna keep growing. Uh, and, and I'm gonna get into the policy charges and all that later. I just wanna kinda take a snapshot of this. Now, here is, uh, we get to year 51 or age 51, year 34 of the policy right here. And you can see this is where we start taking policy loans, net distributions. So you can see the total charges, this is very interesting actually how they do this. I want you to focus on this. The total charge is $2,474. That's what they're saying are the total charges of the policy, which is really interesting. I'm gonna then uh, later, because they have this total charge column, I'm later gonna take some time and go through the actual policy charges page. Um, but you can see here that it looks pretty affordable, right? Like you got $77,000 of income. This doesn't include that loan charges though. That's the thing. This this total charges does not account for loan charges, loan expenses. So that's that's important to understand, right? So um, so as you could see here though, the what's happening is uh, the the net distributions, the income here, keep going up. By the time you're 72, you got 1.7 million dollars after only contributing $164,000. Seems too good to be true. Anything that seems too good to be true typically is. Total charges are low, but look what happens here. The charges later in life get astronomical, even though um, even though the policy is is mature. Now the the idea, the philosophy here is to say, well, there's going to be enough accumulated value right here, cash value, and growth in the policy to manage that, right? But at the end of the day, look right here. You have $549,000 of cash value after all these policy loans, right? And, and I could go back and do this, but I'm gonna focus on this year here because what happens is the, the net amount at risk is astronomical. Uh, the cost of insurance, I should say, is astronomical. So what happens is if this policy does not perform up to illustrated values, which it won't, by the way, I've done, I've done the IUL challenge just to prove this. If this would predictably, I can't say it won't 100%, but I can say you cannot predictably rely on this illustration performing the way that it was sold. And so therefore, the net amount at risk, uh, which is basically the spread between the accumulated value uh, and the death or and the um, and the uh, the cash value here and the death benefit. It doesn't matter how much accumulated value we have in this column, that $9 million, because you have all these policy loans that are not shown on this page. All that matters is you have the $549,000 plus you have the uh, $1 million in death benefit. So let's just say it's a net amount at risk of $450,000, right? So at $450,000, what I want to show here is that you also have $2.8 million, $2,800,000-ish, in policy loans, right? That's actually just the income you've taken out. That's not the total policy loans that you owe because with this 2.8 million here, right? And I'm, when I say this, I'm, I'm, I'm looking right here. With this 2.8 million, that's the income you've taken. You also have interest above and beyond that. That's why there's this gap. You've taken 2 million of, uh, 2.8 million of income, but you can see you have 9 million accumulated value you only have $549,000 of cash value. Take a look at that. So when you look at that and you break it down and you realize, wow, there's like $7 million missing there, like $6 million in change missing there, all that is loan expenses. So all that gap is gonna be what you're liable for. That loan is gonna be due. You have to pay interest on that loan. So if you have a year where the market goes down, right? You're going to have to use this cash value here, that $549,000 to pay that loan. So if you have like even a $6 million loan times 4%, check this out, 4%, that's $240,000, right? Yeah, $240,000. That has to be paid. That loan expense needs to be paid on a flat year. Where's it going to come from? It's going to come from this $549,000. 
because of the fact that they illustrate positive arbitrage, you're never gonna be able to show this. You don't ever experience that reality on an illustration, but life doesn't exist on a spreadsheet. And that's why right here, that number would come out. What does that do? That increases the net amount at risk from 450 to 600 ish, or maybe 700 ish by $240,000, right? And that would bump that up. That would make these charges go higher. And that's where these things become implosive, right? Like they just are catastrophic. Now I could have gone back to these years and done it in this time frame, and it would be the same concept. The only way these illustrations work is because positive arbitrage is assumed on all policy loans when in fact they will never work that way. That is the one guarantee on this illustration, aside from the guaranteed column, of course, is that they will never perform as illustrated. And um, man, it, it's just, it's just kind of gross. So when you look at it, when you look at it that way, um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through this. I wanted you to see that, to understand that concept. I'm gonna go to each page. I'm gonna zoom in. I'm gonna let you take a moment. Uh, if you wanna pause as I'm doing it, I'm gonna go to the pages that I think are relevant, uh, but I, I absolutely in full transparency wanna make sure that everybody can see every single page because I think it's absolutely relevant and important that you see it. And we're gonna go. And uh, okay, so this is what I wanna talk about. Um, it's really interesting. What we just looked at here is a supplemental illustration. So you can see there's like nine pages um, and it goes through what the index is here. Um, the index is uh, these Bloomberg uh, and PIMCO balance indexes. So you see it's 50% in each one, illustrated rate is 6%. These are what we call engineered indexes, okay? These are proprietary. Um, they, they're only used for this product. The goal of this is to keep options costs down. And because they control them. So there's not a lot of competition for the options uh, in this because it's a supply and demand product is what options are. And so they control this. They can either the, keep the options cost in alignment uh, with what their goals are. Uh, but the problem is, is that it's, it's, it's hypothetical. Look back, they've engineered these indexes to look better than they will actually perform. Um, and regulators know this. This is an area. These are the types of indexes right here that regulators, when they're updating regulation AG49A, and I just had a big conversation with Bobby Samuelson about this, I've, done, I've got the interview I'm gonna put on the channel here, but that conversation talks about the fact that these are the indexes that are gonna be hurt the most. And what they're doing is they're gonna be eliminating positive arbitrage on the illustration. So if we go back to what I just showed you, that was only able to be illustrated that way because of positive arbitrage, right? I'm gonna write positive arbitrage, right? And illustrated income, reduced up to 50% on, um, on engineered indexes. right? Think about that. That is crazy. So when we look at these numbers, it's all about, it's once again, it's not that I ever say IULs are horrible. It's horrible how they're sold. It's horrible how they're used. They are not an amazing income vehicle, which they are sold as. That is the problem with them. So we could see here, um, let's see here. So what do we got here? So you can see this is the list of indexes that they have, right? That, that they use and leverage, right? And uh, the, these are the options. So you can see here right now, you look back and uh, the 20 and 25 year window here on these indexes, are, they're not available. They're, they don't have that look back period. Uh, the illustration uh, illustrates the best because of the way the 0.9% bonus illustration will actually perform. Uh, okay, all right, so I'm, I'm, I got my notes here, okay? So, so here's the deal. This is what, what they did. This is one of the tricks that Allianz did. They added in, basically a fixed bonus of 0.9%. But the problem is the fixed bonus is actually in this index when they, when they do this is actually in real life going to perform worse, right? It, because it's, I mean, it's a fixed bonus with it, with an IUL naturally is going to have a lower performance, but because of the illustration regulations, when I always say there's tactics going around, I'm not going to try to get into details of this. This is an area Bobby Samuelson wrote up a blog on this product. It is, 
phenomenal. It, it's, pro, it's a long read, it's a heavy read, but if you're thinking about buying this or you're selling this and you need to understand it, you need to read this blog post and go to lifeproductreview.com and check it out um, and subscribe because it's, it's absolutely awesome. But in that, he talks about the fact that uh, this bonus, this 0.9% bonus, it, it actually performs worse than Illustrated, but because of the way that these, illust these companies mess with these illustration tactics and, and, and the algorithms and the math behind it, they, they, it actually allows them to illustrate at a higher level, which basically tricks the entire system. So the problem with this is, and this is why I'm so adamant and, and I'm such an advocate for people understanding how these things work and understanding what you put your money in because this is the only way they're able to illustrate at the high levels at the 6% that they're doing is by adding this bonus in when in fact it's this bonus is going to have it perform worse but it helps it look better and so the only reason they have these illustrations is to have them look attractive look appealing so you buy them that's that's it they will never perform once again i'm going to just anybody that says i'm wrong I, I challenge you to do the IUL challenge and prove me I'm wrong. Um, and so the other thing is like, I don't know why whoever made this would lead with a supplemental illustration. To me, that's just kind of a shady sales tactic. Um, you know, and they have an, a loan protection rider here. Um, everything else I've already covered. Uh, they have an extra term rider, supplemental term rider. They get some extra insurance, which is cool uh, if they need it and want it and, and probably utilize that term rider to be able to fund and get more cash into the policy for liquidity early. So, okay, that part's good, uh, whoever designed this and you know, whatever. The loan protection rider has to be there because what's gonna happen if you don't have that loan protection rider when you hit retirement and you use it for income and then the policy lapses without this rider, and by the way, this doesn't protect your loan in any way, it just protects you against taxes when that happens, right? So that's important to understand. Um, all right, so the loan, oh, but here's the deal. Like, listen to this. So here's the loan protection rider details. Provides protection, here we go. Provides protection from lapse due to outstanding policy loan. The rider may be exercised if you're between the ages of 75 and 120 and the policy must be enforced for a minimum of 15 policy years. So if you buy this when you're 60, it's not even gonna be in, enforced until you're 75, right? So you need to make sure once exercised, there is a one-time charge, which is a percent of the accumulated value. The rider is automatically included with your policy. This is there to prevent tax ramifications for you. It's a good thing, but it's also important to know when we look at this specific policy, if they start taking loans out at 54, which is what they were, because this is a younger person getting this policy that was shared with me, they start taking policy loans at 54 and the policy runs into a lapse issue at 73 years old and it's lapse early, they're gonna have to come out of pocket for a lot of money or they're gonna get hit with a massive tax bill. So it's it's really, really important to understand that number, okay? So we need to, we need to I think a lot of times the, the agents just try to show that as a huge benefit and don't really you know, clearly communicate what it is. Um, Boom, boom, boom. All right, so Allianz is a company you can trust for the long term. Uh, life insurance product is only as strong as a company that's behind it, you know, yada, yada, yada. They're a stock company. This is, I mean, I get it. They're, they're a, a company that's got a lot of history, but their alliance and allegiance is not to you, the policyholder. Their alliance and allegiance is to their shareholders, and it's one of the reasons, um, you know, you have to realize you are a profit center, and by the time I'm done with this, I think you're gonna see what I'm talking about. Um, this is this is interesting. Um, this, this, is, this is funny to me. So what this page is about is it's showing the flow of money. So you, the policyholder, pay a premium, you get a policy, there's fees that come out of it, and then it goes into an interest allocation and an index allocation, um, and then you can uh, access to available cash through policy loan. So you got your cash build up in the policy. But the reality is it's not how it works at all. I mean, you're, you got the money, the policyholder, right, has money. They pay the policy. Let's just say that's a policy, right? So they pay the policy, okay? And when they pay that policy, the money goes to the insurance company, right? The money then goes from the insurance company. Uh, they know that they're going to get a 4.5%, whatever, 4%. Let's just call it 4% for the sake of argument in this. It's like 4.5%, but they know it's gonna create an options budget. 
okay? So they get, they get that options budget, and at, let's say in this situation they had 16,000 or 15,000. Let's say uh, 15,000 in cash value, that leads to $600 of an options budget, okay? That is gonna go to call options. They buy call options, okay? And then the call options will either win or lose. If the call options come in, uh, you know, well, here, let me do that again. If the call options come in, right, and they hit it, and it's check mark and uh, it goes up, well, then you can earn up to what the cap says. And if the call options lose, well, then you lose this $600 and your $15,000 uh, of cash value in the policy still remains. That's how they say they give you upside potential and downside protection, right? So that is how it works. In here, they don't really explain that at all. They give a very simplistic way that is actually uh, not fully transparent about how the money flows, how they're using a hedging strategy, how you're not really in the index. They say index allocation. Um, it, it's just a bit deceptive, in my opinion, as far as how they're going about sharing that. Um, so interest rates and policy, I got these things highlighted, so it means I should probably read them. So interest rates and policy charges are only two of the many factors that can affect your policy's actual performance. The timing and amount of premiums that you pay, loans or surrenders you take, and policy benefit changes have a large effect on your policy values. Your actual policy values will not match the non-guaranteed values in this illustration, right? Policy loans and withdrawals will reduce the available cash value and death benefit and may cause the policy to lapse, right? So they say this in all the fine print, but on the illustrations on the ledger, they never show it. They just go, oh, this is just how it's gonna be. And they assume every single year is gonna be a positive year. It's absolutely absurd. So, uh, and, or affect guarantees against lapse, right? So like that, that important to understand. Um, so, here, they're just trying to show how does an index work, right? Like it levels off instead of going down, it levels off and then you start from this new point and it goes up and whatever. So everybody knows that one. But I think what's important to understand here when they talk about, oh, a lot of agents will say to me like, you could put money in a fixed interest rate, uh, interest rate account and if a dividend in a whole life policy is 5% and I can get a fixed rate in an IUL, why wouldn't I do that? Um, because if the fixed rate is 5% in an IUL, that's just as good. Well, no, it's not because IULs, the costs are constantly going up and whole life, they're very flat and they're very measured and they're very controlled. And so when you utilize uh, a fixed interest strategy, all you're doing is turning your IUL into a traditional UL platform. Because remember, IUL simply equals a UL plus options strategy. When you get rid of the option strategy by, by uh, doing the fixed interest crediting rate, what you're doing is you're basically eliminating the option strategy and all you have left is the UL platform. You get rid of the index component and you have the UL. That's all that happens with this, right? So I think that's really, really important to, to understand. And so ULs are absolutely horrible products. And when you look at this and it, it, like they try to sell this like it's a good thing, Anybody that does that either doesn't understand IULs or doesn't understand whole life or probably effectively doesn't understand both fully. Um, all right, so eliminate the, okay, this is, this is the part that I was talking about. So the possibility, eliminate the possibility of receiving zero interest, right? So what's happening is uh, this feature is available with the Bloomberg uh, Dynamic Index and the PIMCO Tactical Balanced ER Index. Now, what are we talking about? This is the bonus that I was talking about earlier, right? So it, it, this is, uh, let's see here. This is the 0.9% the bonus. So what's gonna happen is this is what, all it's doing is trying to show you, this is how it illustrates better because it's, it's bumping up the performance. But once again, it's only available on the Bloomberg and the PIMCO, which are the engineered indexes. And so, I don't think it's a coincidence that you can't use that on the S&P stuff. They're able to control and manipulate and do all sorts of different things around that. Um, so this is, when we come down to it, this is the classic, classic strategy. So when you look at this, this 0.9% fixed bonus tracks, uh, tricks AG49, this is kind of what I was saying before, tricks AG49 to illustrate better when it will actually perform worse. Go to Life Product Review, 
dot com. I just I'll, I'll write it out just so in case life product review dot com. Go check it out. I encourage everybody to read that article. It is amazing. Bobby is brilliant. Now you can see AG 49A restricts what you can get for a bonus rate, how these work, and it restricts the illustrations. So you would think that um, the bonus rate of 40% and 15% would totally outperform, but you'll notice that everybody that runs this product will almost always illustrate it with the classic at the 0.9% bonus, which is far less utilizing those proprietary indexes that I just talked about. And the reason is because this is what's going to illustrate better and look better on paper, making it more appealing, more attractive, sexier looking for your retirement income. But at the end of the day, it's not going to perform as sold. So you need to be aware when it comes to that. Um, so uh, your allocation options, the maximum illustrated for this rate, uh, for years one to maturity is 6%. So it's just showing this. The current part, so you can see there's no cap on these. So there are no cap indexes. The illustrated rate is 6%, 6% uh, on each. And they got a 160 and 165% participation rate. Now, the thing that's important to understand is on top of all that, these numbers can be reduced, right? It's important to say. So you can see cap participation rates and trigger interest rates are subject to change on any policy anniversary. The indexes available within the policy are constructed to keep track of diverse segments here, boom, of the US or international markets or specific market sectors. Indexes are benchmarks only. Indexes can have different constituents and or weighting methodologies. Some indexes have multiple versions that can weight components that may track uh, the impacts of dividends differently. Although an index may affect your interest credited, you cannot buy or directly participate in or receive dividend payments from any of them through the policy. So this is like the fine print, right? Like where they're telling you all this is the legal jargon that, you know, kind of protects them and insulates them. But it's important to know that these numbers here, these can be reduced, right? Really important. I'm going to get into more of the details when we get to the policy fees and the index pages and all that different stuff. Uh, this, so this is interesting to me. This is, this is where they go through and they say, all right, here's the history of the performance, right? These years, 2005 through 2021. This is the actual performance. This is the hypothetical return, but none of this is actually true. You can see, uh, you know, this is all just manufactured, right? Like this is, um, historical compound average, uh, historical rates allocation. Uh, let's see. They do not include the bonuses is what it says, uh, which is interesting because, you know, they're trying to make it look like, oh, the bonuses are better and it's on top of it. Allocation options represent both initial and future allocations. Uh, la, 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 la. No, it doesn't say anything, anything consequential down there on that one. Um, and so this is going to be the same thing uh, for the other index, the PIMCO uh, balance ER fund. Same deal. Um, same deal. They don't have the 25 year hypothetical look back history period on this, which is crazy to me that they're able to do that. The, the time frame isn't even, isn't even that long. It's got a 12 year surrender period, which is really important to understand. Um, I got negative ARB written here. So why? Oh yeah. So you have the option. A lot of options also say is that you can, if you don't want to do the index loan or it's 5% on policies. So if you take an index loan in this policy, you have to pay 5% loan cost. So if you have a million dollars of loans out during, in, during your retirement years, that's $50,000 a year of interest just to manage that loan. So if the market goes down, not only do you have the insurance costs that go along with it when you're 72 years old, but now you have $50,000 if you have a million dollar loan out because of all your previous income, you have $50,000 more of, of loan interest that you have to manage that will come out of your cash value, increasing your net cost of insurance, uh, the net amount at risk, which will then drive it up. That's what I showed you on the last illustration. That's important to understand. Um, is there a potential to earn positive arbitrage? Yeah, but it's not much. And there's a lot of risk to take that chance, especially in retirement years when you're gonna want it the most. Fixed loans, look at this, 2.91% um, in, uh, in year one through 10. You get credited when you choose the fixed loans, you only get a 2% crediting 
Uh, and if you choose these loan options and you only get credited that amount, that's gonna decimate your ability for your policy to grow. It's gonna increase your net amount at risk in the policy over time compared to the illustrated rates. And ultimately that's gonna wind up being a drag on the policy and increasing the chance of lapsing. These things are like trigonometry and they're being sold as if they're like basic multiplication, right? So it's, it's important to understand this. So the rate credited will also include any applicable interest bonus earned via the interest bonus rider, right? Like, so that's what I was talking about on the last page that it'll make it look good, but it's not as good as it sounds. Uh, the illustration is not an offer contract or promise for the future of the policy performance. Here we go. Taxation of life insurance. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can read it, pause it. Um, everybody knows I've done a lot of uh, conversations about that. Glossary of terms. Um, all right. So, so, so this was interesting. There was a couple things I noticed here. So usually we have increasing death benefit, which is uh, option B, or we have level death benefit, which is option A. This is option C, which is equal to the specified amount of your policy plus the total premium you've paid into the policy. Basically an increasing death benefit, but they call it something else. I've never seen this before. My question is why? I'm going to ask Bobby Samuelson what's going on with this next time I talk to him because um, I'm sure he knows the answer to this. Um, I don't, quite frankly, and I don't get stumped with questions very often. I have yet to see this and I'm kind of fascinated by it, quite frankly. Um, it's interesting. So alternative crediting rate and charges, right, right here, referred to as the alternative scenario values are calculated using the current fixed interest crediting rate and our current administrative and insurance charges. So what I'm going to do, so this is the important thing here, alternative crediting rate and charges. What that is like basically the alternate alternate column in the illustration, you'll notice there's a current there's guaranteed and then there's an alternate. What the what this is saying is that the alternate column referred to as alternate alternative scenario values are calculated using the current fixed interest rate crediting, meaning 5%. So it shows what would your policy perform as at a 5% performance and our current administrative insurance charges, okay? So assuming charges don't get more expensive or cap rates don't go down or participation rates don't go down, which they most likely will, which will have a drag once again on everything, right? And so this is the guaranteed scenario. Uh, I will say this is better than most IULs as far as this goes. On the front end here, this $14,000 of net cash value year one available. Uh, you know, going down through year 10 on a guaranteed basis, you got 142, uh, you know, versus uh, 140 on, you know, because the surrender period at the end of the surrender uh, in year 12, you can see we're about even. But look at this, just right away on the guaranteed value, this policy starts to go down. So they this this person at 18 years old put money into the policy and it goes and it grows. And then by the time they hit 52 years old, which is before they were even going to pay income on a guaranteed basis, this thing lapses. Like, you know, the, the, this uh, it can't even hit their target on a guaranteed basis with how they funded it. Yet somehow it's going to create $5.4 million of income predictably. It's it's absolutely insane. So so I don't know why I wrote 3% there because it's 5% because they're using the alternate alternate um, uh, income, right? So that is the current scenario is at 6%, the alternate's at 5%. And so um, it's important to understand that. Um, so as we go down through this, as we look at, uh, I, you know, we got, all right, the same thing, 10 years in, it's showing the current is at 208, the alternate's at 196. I'm going to just skip to the next page. And what we're going to do here is we're going to see on the alternate level, assuming, once again, I don't know why I have 3% there. My apologies, 5%. At, assuming that it does 5%, what you're seeing here is at 62 this thing lapses, right? Yet somehow, once again, it's just gonna go gangbusters on the current scenario because of the, uh, the arbitrage, right? Like the, the, the illustrated arbitrage that I've already explained and I'm not gonna beat that horse too hard. Um, that is what it is. But this, this policy lapses at age 62, right? That's, that's gross. And that is huge difference with only 1% of the crediting difference, right? Like, so think about this. This is assuming that it's only 1% less than the 6%, which is 
a very bold statement on the company's part to think that they're going to do that when they can only get their own general fund four and a half percent, right? That which, by the way, is about a 40 percent increase of what they're doing for themselves, right? So that's already bold enough, right? So why in the world would only a one percent difference between six percent and five percent have this policy lapse there, not get you the income, and 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 not? It's because of the fact of how the compounding of the loans and the expenses and everything gets. And this does not even account for the fact, well, I should say this is assuming that your current charges and fees and expenses inside of the policy remain as illustrated and don't get worse, which historically speaking, they have and they will um, most likely. Um, so 5% again, um, I must have been thinking something else when I kept writing the three. Um, so. That is what it is. Um, but you can see here, this keeps going on. Uh, the, the accumulated value, the cash value, the net distributions on a non-guaranteed basis, the current scenario keeps going. This is where the income gets crazy, right? 3 million in income by 92. Um, and you can see it's 3.6 million by the time you're 97. But you can see here, it's the cash value is growing. The, the right here, it shows you got $3.6 million. Okay, so here, I wanna do this. I, this is so, so fun. <laughs> I'm such a nerd. So you got 3.6 million, uh, but you have 15.3 million. I'm just gonna kind of get close, right? 15.3 million and 3.6 million. Oh, yeah, 3.6 million, right? So what do we have? We have, uh, do, 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 7, 12, 11, 700,000 of loans and, you know, loans out there due on this. So what will happen is if, if this, like this is assuming with this scenario, because you got 15,300, I'm going to just erase that, $15,346 of net cash uh, of, of accumulated value, 1 million of net cash value, but you have 3,650,000 of distributions. So what do we have here actually? So what we need to do here is we say, all right, we got cash. So it's a, it's actually, I did that wrong. It's 15 million minus the 1 million, which let's just call it 14 million for the sake of it. And then we have the distributions is uh, 3.6. So we got about 10.5 million ish in loans on this thing. And those loans, that's what is actually due. That's what's going to be your, your uh, at risk for when the market has a bad year and the growth of the policy cannot sustain those loans, right? If, if like, because remember, this is assuming this $15 million is going to go up 5%. And if that $15 million, actually in this, it's assuming it's going to go up 5.5%. So on, on the loan money, so it's assuming you're going to get credited all that money and that's going to cover the loan expense. But if it doesn't, if you have a zero year here, what's going to happen is it's not going to cover it and it's going to take that out of there. So I'm going to just get my phone real quick and tell you how, what the, what the expense of this is going to be. Um, and it's, it's kind of astronomical. Okay. Uh, 15 million time, or actually it's uh, 12 million what did I say? 10.5 million. Sorry. Let's just go 10.5 million times 0 0.05. You're looking at $525,000 of loan expenses alone. That's going to be taken out of the 1.13. That is going to decimate the entire account. So when people say, oh, it's going to take three, four, five years of bad years in a row to decimate a policy. No, it can happen very quickly. It can happen in two or three years. And it's once it happens and you get behind in these things because of the fact that you're not paying back the loans, Comp the, the expenses and charges compound against you and these things get out of control and implode all the time. Um, so like I said, I just kind of made the note, the midpoint scenario, um, it says 3% non-guaranteed. That's why I put that there. Um, but it's, it's the 5%, like it said on the other one, but it, it's policy charges could get worse than this as well. Um, you eliminate the, uh, nine, 0.9% bonus and add the 1% charges. And this is uh, a, like just a, a crazy assumption that all this is going to happen. Um, these are, this is why I say when I, when I say an IUL is going to perform worse 
and it's illustrated, it's because of all this nonsense that we're seeing. Sorry if I'm sounding a little bit emotional about it, but it's massively irritating to me. Um, so, all right, here we go. Policy loan ledger. This is interesting. This is going to be fun. So you can see there's no policy loans. We got the cash value right here in this column. That's the cash value uh, on a current scenario basis, not a guaranteed basis with a current 6% assumption basis. That is what it is. We're not taking policy loans until we're like 54 in this. Um, and that is what it is. Now, here we go. So you can see the cash value is growing. By the time you start taking income, you're at $800,000, assumed with that 6% rate. Now we have the index loan, 73, um, uh, 77, 6, 6, 76. We got loan charges of that, and then we have loan credits. So you can see this spread right here between the two of a couple hundred bucks is what allows this number to keep growing, right? These numbers to keep growing and it allows the illustration to be healthy. That's the positive arbitrage that we're talking about. You can see but the, the gap right here between $8,196 and $9,396. That's positive arbitrage that's baked in. They're assuming that that is going to happen. Now, that's, I don't know about you, but I don't know another time where there's been, you know, this period of time where there's been no down years. There's definitely going to be worse years. And if you have policy loans out on this, as you get older and as the cost of insurance go, not only do you have these extra charges that'll be more expensive, but now because of, uh, the outstanding loan balance is going to be higher in this column. The net amount at risk, because the cash value will be worse because it's got to support that, right? Now the net amount at risk goes up, which increases the cost of insurance, right? Goes up as well, which then compounds against it because that's got to eat from the cash value. And you're going to take loans to pay that because that's how it goes out of the cash value if you don't cut a check for it, which you're not going to because you're in retirement. And so then what happens is the outstanding loan balance goes up. And so this is what I'm saying. This stuff is insanity, right? So, so the loan balance compounds against you. You can see by the time you're 67, you got $2 million of loans out there with only $1.3 million of, of income, right? So you're talking about all this stuff. You're paying interest on this $2 million. And on bad years, that's what whacks you, right? And so it's really, really important to see. Actually, so now I was talking about before, um, I guess I got a little bit ahead of myself. So this, this gap right here, you can see it's about $500,000 of positive arbitrage. That's what allows this thing to keep going. And um, it's not gonna be that way with AG49B coming out. It's gonna fix it. Uh, difference um, will increase uh, the cost of insurance. Compound, uh, th that difference, I should say, it will increase if we if we reduce this positive arbitrage we'll do what i just said increase the cost of insurance which will compound the problem which will make this policy lapse even faster but you can see here no i was right at 92 i was right i said 10.5 million uh it was 10.788 million is the total outstanding loan balance so meanwhile while we've gotten 3.2 million of income we got 10 million that we owe five percent annually on uh, and in down years, you got to pay that no matter what. That's $500,000 annual expense just to manage that loan, even on down years. And you only got $600,000 of cash value. Can you say kapoom? This thing is toast. It's going up in flames. Uh, and I mean, I could go back here and I could do the same thing. Like you got $6 million. Like actually, let me go back to when you're, when you're 75 even, okay? You got $3.8 million. $431,000. If you have a negative year in that year, let's just do this. If you have 4.8 million, right? Times 0 0.05, that's $240,000. You only have $431,000, right? You have one year like that. You got a $240,000 extra interest expense. That's going to be taken as a loan against your cash value. It's going to increase your loan cost. And what that's gonna do is increase your net amount at risk. And that right there, one year at age 75 in this situation is going to implode this policy, okay? So that is, um, that like, man, I didn't even do that ahead of time. Like that is mind numbing to me how agents can be selling this garbage and, and doing it, feeling like they're doing it in integrity. It makes no sense to me how they feel 
they can do this. And so this is the same thing, but like I'm skipping this uh, because we're talking about just getting into like crazy years. It's all the same concepts. You could see by the end of this, you got, if you live to 117 years old, you got $40 million of loan expenses, right? Like it's just, it's absurd. It's like anybody with a brain can figure out that's just unrealistic. Uh, this is just policy credits and charges. This is all stuff that we've covered. I'm going to pause on each page. If you want to check to verify, there's nothing on this page that I haven't talked about already. Uh, there's just a bunch of redundancy in this. Um, same thing here. If you want to, if you want to look at it, go for it. Same thing here. If you want to look at it, go for it. Same thing here. Just give you a second to get it. Boom. All right. So now when we talk about, when I talked about uh, needing to take policy loans to cover the interest expense of, of your stuff, and that's going to increase the net amount at risk, which increases the cost of insurance, so on and so forth. So let's just jump right ahead. So this is the cost of insurance column. You can see this is where people, agents go, oh, well, IUL is cheaper than whole life. Well, yeah, it looks, looks cheaper because of all this stuff, right? Right out of the gate. Most of their charges are in their riders, as you can see here, right? That's, that's where they go. So let's go to the next page. Uh, the rider charges is where they start to really get you. You can see the cost of insurance is always going to be lower right there, right? Like that, they, they keep it reined in pretty well. But the rider charges is where it starts to kind of start to go up. And what's going to happen here, because they've taken uh, income starting at 54, what I want to show here is you could see um, that the cost of insurance goes down in this red area but the rider charges take over and basically function as a cost of insurance, right? And um, though that's where the fees get crazy. But at the end of the day, when you, when you have issues where, you know, that $240,000 of interest expense that I, that I was kind of showing you, right? When that happens at age 75, right? And, and, you know, you wind up having to take that out of the cash value, and that increases the net amount at risk and doubles these charges. And then you have to take loans from it. And so you, now you have an extra 5% on that, another additional 240,000 plus the 8K, right? It all adds up. And that's why I always tell people it's one or two bad years at the wrong time in retirement for these policies and everything goes up in flames, right? Um, it's, it's really important to understand that. Um, you could see when people say the cost of insurance is cheaper than whole life insurance. Look at the total policy charges, $946,000. This is absolutely nuts. You've put in $164,000 in premium and you've got $946,000 of charges. IUL, folks, is the most expensive piece of trash product on the face of the earth and this is why? Anybody that doesn't look at this and take the time to read this, that's the problem. Too many people buy this without understanding it and they're sold on the smoke and mirrors and the hype of the illustrations and the ledgers without reading all the fine print. Um, and so now this is where um, the stuff comes in. So I think it's important to understand. I want to make a couple, a couple comments. The compound annual growth rate for any four year period in this sequence is 6%, right? So remember, this is a gross rate. That is a not net rate after all fees. That is just what you're getting credited. Then you got to back out all the charges and the fees, and then you'll get your net rate. That is what it is. This is their, this is their disclaimers to protect themselves when your policy lapses. And so they are protected against class action lawsuit. After you purchase a fixed index, a new uh, index universal life policy, it's critical that you review it annual and react to the changing needs of the market conditions. You may also request an enforced illustration at any time during the life of your policy, which will show uh, up-to-date policy values and will illustrate how the policy may react going forward. Um, yeah, that's all good stuff. I think you should do that whether you have IUL, whether you have whole life. I think it's important to be really in touch uh, with what you're doing, uh, have a real clear understanding about what's going on with your money, where is it going, how's it working, all these different things. Um, but the bottom line, when I look at this, I go, man, uh, this thing is just not going to stack up, you know, and, and it's not, not hard to see that. Right. So, um, I'm not going to go through all the different things, but it's just other important information here for people to, to understand. So if the cash value is less 
policy lapsing, if the cash value is less uh, than the amount of the policy charge due and your policy does not pass a policy protection test, your policy will enter a 61 day grace period. If your policy lapses, you will lose coverage and you may owe income tax on the money you took out, including any outstanding loan balances. So as we say that, actually, I want to do this. I want to go back here. This is going to be ridiculous. So we're on 45. I want to go back uh, to the loans. Let me see here. I want to go back to the loans right here. So if you went and this policy lapsed at 72 years old because it's before they're 75, okay? And they had $1,363,000 plus $3,071,000 in loans. They're, they could get hit with a tax bill if it lapsed in this year for $4.3 million. $4,300,000 is what they would get a tax bill on. Think about that. That is absolutely absurd to me um, that, yeah, gosh, it's, it's, just, it's just atrocious. It's just atrocious. I don't even have words. All right, let's go. Um, I think we're getting near the end here. Uh, additional. If your minimum monthly premium increases, you may need to pay additional premium to protect your policy from lapsing. Uh, in addition, if you make any of the above material changes, a new seven year, pre uh, seven year premium limitation will begin at that time and you will have new premium limitations under section 7702A of the Internal Revenue Code. And um, so this is just showing when the policy will lapse, age 35 uh, on, a, on a guaranteed basis, um, or year 35, year 38 with the non-guaranteed assumption in the middle at the 5% crediting rating, and somehow year 103, which is 120 years old. Uh, because this person's 17, so it would be like, you know, that plus 17, that plus 17 is when they when they end on a guaranteed basis. And so, you know, then they just, you know, they got to sign it and they got to do all the things and like whatever, but um, is what it is. Uh, there is no assurance. I got this highlighted in red. There is no assurance that the investment products, uh, because this is, what is this on? Um, this is about a specific index. S&P, Dow Jones, S&P, Dow Jones indexes. There's no assurance that the investment products based in the index and average will accurately track index performances or provide positive investment returns, right? So like, here's what I got to say at the end of this, like they got pages of these disclosures that you just got to read, right? Um, so this is going through, this is a, uh, a section all for the PIMCO index. It goes through it. I'm going to zoom in. I really don't have the energy to read this anymore. Uh, it's all the same stuff. It's basically saying uh, they've licensed this. It's for the purpose, but they don't pick the investments and, you know, they're they're not guaranteed to perform. And, uh, you know, you can see here it may lose value. They've got all these things. It's not FDIC insured. Uh, this is the Bloomberg index page. I would say read this, pause it if you want to see it, go through, go nuts. And um, what this is showing, which is crazy, is that this is showing the internal rate of return based on compounding in this policy, uh, based on current scenarios and taking all the variables of the policy into consideration. Um, but once again, this is never, ever, ever going to happen. And I think if you don't see that by now, after all the detailed breakdown that I've given you in this policy, I don't know what to tell you. Um, you get what you get when it comes to the results in your personal finances if you put your money into this product. So like I said, how can an insurance company get you this six to 7% return almost over that long period of time uh, when they can't do it for themselves, right? It's not gonna happen. It is what it is. You can see it just gets better and better and better. Not gonna happen. Uh, read it, go ahead. I don't think it's anything new or special, but this is the end of it. You can see uh, this policy, this is just the policy specifics page, how they designed it. You can see it's an option B increasing up until age 64. I don't know why it's increasing to 64. I think that's a mistake. That's the only real design flaw that I saw because they start taking income, I think, at 54. So they should have this at age 54 and then change it to um, being level death benefit option A at, at age 54. 
or 55 through maturity, right? That's what, that's what they should have done. They didn't do that. Um, once again, this is, it would be trash either way, this product. Um, but that is the mistake that I saw. The only mistake that I saw on that side of it. Um, but ultimately guys, this is, this is the number one IUL product that's being sold by independent advisors out there right now that are in the index universal life space. This is the number one product. Yet somehow, um, as you see, like th this is why I always say they never perform as illustrated. And you can see why I'm saying that now. Hopefully it makes sense. I believe personally that the reason this is the number one sold product right now is because it's the number one compensated product. You can earn up to 155% commission by selling this product. It is to me an atrocity uh, that people would sell this to people and that, that advisors either are unaware that this is how it works or they're implicit in it and they're aware and they're just making money off the tears of their clients. That's, I heard a guy say that one time about an IUL and I was like, oh man, God, that's funny. I'm going to steal that. So here I am stealing it. So anyway, I obviously am pretty bold in my opinion, pretty bold in my stance. I understand that I'm going to have a lot of people that disagree with me, um, but I, I'm no interest in opinions. I, I just want fact. If you can tell me one thing that I said on here that was wrong, um, tell me, you know, and, and let's have a conversation about it. This is just one example. I'm trying to do uh, illustration reviews on all different Index Universal Life companies and products or whatever. So if you have one that you're interested in, send it to me. I'll do an evaluation of it. I'll do exactly what I just did right here and we'll go from there. So if you have any questions, comment in the comment section below. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell and do all those things. Uh, that way uh, you're notified every time I launch a new video. Till next time, have a blessed, inspirational day. We'll talk soon.